good. It works. Um, yes, thank you for having me. Uh, like I said, my name's uh, Laurel. I'm a postdoc at Los Alamos National Lab, working at the Magnet Lab. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with the idea of a postdoc, um, basically I'm in some hazy region between not a grad student and not yet a full-blown scientist, faculty, professor, what have you. So um, still definitely in the learning phases, but I'm doing a lot of research on my own, which is very exciting. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about electricity, magnetism, a little bit about myself, um, how these two in things intersect. Um, uh, feel free to ask questions as we go along, um, if you have any. So can anyone tell me what they think of when they think of electricity or magnetism? Any words that come to mind? Don't be shy. Action, good. Anyone else? Thank you. <laughs> anyone? Don't be shy. Interactions, that's a good one. That's a really good one. Okay, so those are some good ideas. I sat down at my desk for five minutes and wrote down as many things as I could think of. Um, hopefully a lot of these words are familiar to you. If they're not, I'm going to discuss many of them. Um, and then certainly afterwards we can talk about them in more detail. But there's a lot of concepts and ideas that tie into electricity and magnetism. So I'm not a huge history person, but I actually was doing some research for this talk and I, I got really interested in all the little science tidbits. So I'm going to give you a very, very brief, my biased cho cho uh, choices of history of electricity, magnetism. If you want some more information, the National High Magnetic Field Lab's website is here and they have a great um, site with a lot of educational things, demonstrations, uh, history, more history, um, and just about magnets in general. So. I would point you in that direction. So the first thing I learned was that compasses were first developed in around 300, 200 BC by the Chinese. And compasses were obviously a great uh, advantage to people because now they didn't have to worry about navigating as much by stars or landmarks, which I imagine would be quite different, difficult when you're in the ocean and it's cloudy and rainy and you can't see anything. So with compasses, it made navigation a lot easier. Um, but then we're going to jump now to the 1700s, uh, where Leiden jars were first created. And these are what we think of, can think of now as modern day capacitors. So they're devices that store electricity. This is essentially a glass jar with different metals on it that will allow the electricity to stay inside. And scientists could then use this electricity to study how electricity works in general or to do demonstrations like some of the things I'm going to show you today. And then many of you might be familiar with Benjamin Franklin's kite experiment where he tied um, a key and actually a Leiden jar to the key and flew his kite in a rainstorm because he wanted to see whether or not lightning was electricity. And so he allegedly did this and you know, survived to tell the tale and found that electricity, um, lightning is, has electricity or is electricity. Then I came across this interesting idea of an animal electricity. Um, this uh, scientist, Luigi Gavani, was studying frogs and he hung them on brass uh, hooks they were dead, and he would cut them up with scalpels to study them, and he would find that they would twitch when he cut them open, and they would be moving like they were alive. So he hypothesized that there was this thing called animal uh, electricity. So animals had their own type of electricity, which was different from like a lightning electricity. Um, Alessandro Volta was actually a big opponent of this idea and was like, I don't think you think was happening is actually happening. Um, and so what he proposed was the reason the, the frog's muscles were twitching is because there was actually electrical um, conductivity or electrons flowing between two different metals, the scalpel blade and the brass hook. And that was causing electricity to go through the animal's muscles and cause them to twitch. And so Alessandro Volta actually developed what we now can call the first battery, a voltic pile, um, where he used different metals, brass and, um, or copper and I don't remember the other one at all. But two different metals um, where he put um, in salt water brine so there would be some electricity and they could flow between each other. And then we attach wires to the two sides of the, the pile, a current would flow, electricity would flow. And so people use these like you would use um, batteries. Uh, shortly after that, Hans Ersted, who um, was a Dutch scientist, found when he was giving a lecture that he had current flowing through a wire. And he noticed that a needle of a compass started moving when the current flowed through the wire. And so this was the first time someone at least reported that they saw that electricity was causing a magnetic field reaction. 
or an event of magnetism. And so this caused a big stir in the scientific community, the idea that these two separate things, electricity and magnetism, were somehow related to each other or interacting with each other. This quickly then followed um, three laws that I'm going to talk about in more detail um, in a few moments. But first, Ampere's law, where he saw that if you had two, current, uh, two wires with currents flowing through them, if the currents were flowing in the same direction, then the wires would attract to each other. And if the wires were flowing in opposite directions, the currents, they would uh, repel from one another. So that was kind of interesting. Faraday then came up, um, found this property that if you have two coils of wire, one is attached to a battery, has electricity flowing through the coil of wire. If you then placed it and moved it inside to a second coil of wire, current would then flow in that second coil of wire that was connected to no battery. And so this is the idea of law of induction, that you could induce a current in one coil from another coil. And what I actually think of when I think of Faraday's law of induction is the um, magnetic analog, where if you have a coil of wire and you put a magnet moving through it, will induce a current. And I'll show you guys that in a couple minutes. And then finally, Lenz's law is kind of a tie-in to Faraday's law of induction with the idea that um, the magnetism that is induced in this current or, sorry, the current that is induced in, when you put a magnet through a coil of wire is um, created to oppose the magnetic field that's been, putting, been put inside it. Um, and if this is a little confusing, hazy, don't worry. I'm going to show you all of this with some of my cool toys in a moment, and we'll talk about it in more detail. So these ideas really started the ball rolling on the idea that electricity and magnetism are not only very intimately connected, but they're actually two different parts of the same subject. So they're not separate entities. They are actually combined into what we call electromagnetism. And so I don't expect you, maybe you've probably never seen these, maybe you have. It doesn't really matter what they say mathematically, but the concept is that James Maxwell came up with four simple equations that explained how electricity and magnetism are not only related to each other, but they interact with each other. They're one and the same. And this was remarkable that you could say all that in these four relatively simple equations. Um, so much so that he could use these equations to show that electro, um, electric waves and magnetic waves travel at the speed of light, which we know to be true now. And that light itself is actually a form of electromagnetic radiation. So these are very powerful laws that were, came about in the mid-1800s that physicists still use to this day. We learn in, in graduate school and probably in high school sometimes. So Now that history is over, we're going to talk about some more science, and I'm going to show you some more science. So Ampere's law, to revise, uh, review, is the idea that current flowing through a wire will create a magnetic field. And so this is the first time you get to use physics right hand rule. So if you use your right hand, your thumb is the current, and your fingers are your magnetic field. So it's a really easy way to figure out which way the magnetic field is moving. So in this example, if this is the current, then the magnetic field from my view is moving counterclockwise. Similarly, if you put your current going down in this direction, then your magnetic field now moves in the opposite direction. And so this is why Ampere saw that when he had two wires with currents moving in the same direction, they attracted each other. And when they move in opposite directions, they repel each other because the magnetic fields are actually going in the same direction and two like charges, or two magnetic fields want to go apart. So if you have a north pole and a north pole of a magnet, they want to repel each other. And so that's why he saw that these magnetic, these wires were attracted in repelling each other. Um, the same thing happens in a coil of wire. Um, so these are really thick coils of wire, um, which I'll talk about in more detail. But the same idea, you just have a wire and it's made into a coil. If you flow electricity through this coil, you're going to get magnetic field that will go out in field lines like this. And that's what's shown here on this picture. And this is really similar to how if you have a bar magnet, then the, the magnetic field lines will move from the North Pole to the South Pole. And so I can actually show you a demonstration of this while we flick on the lights. Um, if I can remember which demonstration that I'm supposed to show you. Oh, here we go. Um, so I have here a coil of wire, and it's wrapped around a nail, mostly to keep um, the coil together, and also because it will help extend the magnetic field lines. Um, so it's not attached to anything. I have this pile of paper clips. It doesn't pick up anything. So it's not magnetic. However, if I attach it to a battery, 
and then go over the paper clips, it will pick them up. Because the current flowing through the wire has now created a magnetic field, and because this nail is probably some sort of iron in it, it magnetizes the nail as well, so it helps pick up more nails. But even if I had no coil of wire there, it would still pick up the, the paper clips. And it gets warm because there's current flowing through it. So, so that's uh, Ampere's law in action. Um, Faraday's law of induction, again, um, in magnet form, is if you have a coil of wire and then you have a magnet. And this is a meter that'll tell us what the current is doing inside of the coil of wire. So right now the magnet is outside the coil, it's not doing anything, the meter doesn't work, or it's not reading anything. And I have the same thing over here on the table. This is my giant coil of wire now, and this is a meter with the same little dial on it. Now, if I move the magnet into the coil of wire, for those of you in the front, you can see that the needle moves to the right. My, you're right, my, yeah, you're right. <laughs> but if it just sits inside, it doesn't move at all. And then when I pull it out, it goes in the opposite direction. And so what this shows is that you need a moving magnet in a coil of wire to create an electric field. If the magnet's just hanging out in the coil, coil doesn't care, there's no electric field, there's no current running. So that is Faraday's law of induction. Um, and that's what, again, is shown here in just this diagram. And this ties in um, to Lenz's law, which you can leave this up, now includes my favorite science demos. So this one is my second most favorite, but, so we'll start with it. So here I have three, um, four, five, can't count, five different um, materials. This is plastic, this is copper, brass, one of these is, I think it's aluminum, um, steel, some combination of metals. Um, and I have two really strong magnets that'll stick and pinch my fingers if I'm not careful. But none of these materials on their own are magnetic. Does anyone want to guess what happens when I drop them down the slides? Anyone? Don't be shy. Some of you have seen this, so you shouldn't give the answers. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? Okay. Yes? Do you have a guess? Yes. Yeah. Okay. This one? Than the, the, the plastic? Okay, let's see if you're right. Ready? Oh. Isn't that awesome? But remember, it wasn't magnetic. It didn't it doesn't stick by itself. So this is plastic, so obviously like we don't Plastic doesn't do anything. And the one on the end is copper. I keep losing these. What about this middle one, which is probably brass? It's not as fat. It's not as slow as this, right? So what does anyone have a guess as what's happening? Obviously, it matters what type of material you're looking at, right? Plastic doesn't care. Copper's really good. It's really slow. Now I'm losing my magnets. This one's pretty, maybe it's a little bit faster than the plastic, slower than the plastic. So what's happening here is that these metals, like I said, are not magnetic by themselves. But when you have a moving magnet, what did we just see? That it creates a current, right? So when you move, when these fall, gravity assisted, of course, then a magnetic field is producing a current. And the magnet, the idea of Lenz's law is that you produce a current that creates a magnetic field in the opposite direction. So it wants to slow it down. So it's kind of like um, Newton's laws. Objects at rest stay at rest, objects in motion stay in motion. It's the idea that whatever the magnetic field state is to begin with is what it wants to stay at. So I'm a, making a magnetic field, it wants to stop the magnetic field, so it slows it down. So hopefully that made some sense, if you guys have questions, and we can play with it again at the end of the, the talk. But now this is my all-time favorite. Does anyone want to help me? Are there any volunteers? Um, yeah, come on. Go ahead. I have two right now, but we, yeah. Does anyone else want to help? You want to come up? Okay, let's see if I have any more magnets. We can take turns with the magnets. No, this way. All right, I only have two magnets, so we're going to have to take turns. That's fine. Here, you want to hold? Yeah. You want to hold this little one? Okay. So now we are going to fight over the magnets. You get one. Let's all stand in the line. I'm going to touch you, sorry. Okay. 
Good? All right, we'll start with you and then we'll trade. All right, so these two have the magnets, so face the audience. We're going to have a race, okay? So you're going to drop your magnets in the tubes at the same time, and we're going to see what happens, okay? Well, marker three. One, two, three. Where's yours? Hers came out. Where's yours? <laughs> it's oh, so it's, it's oh, <laughs> all right. Let's you guys try. You want to put it in there? Are you ready? One, two, three. Put it in. Oh, yours fell through very quickly. <laughs> you want to try again? Stuck. Yours is stuck. Uh, no, it's not. It'll see. It's, it's still going down. Just and drop it, James. It's right there. Is it yours? No, oh, no, it's, it's still going. It's still going. What's it's happening over here? No, that one's stuck. <laughs> <laughs> she, she broke it. It's okay. All right, thank you guys. You can sit down and take these poles back. Now that I have missing magnets and this one's stuck. Thank you. Oh, you're still up. Thank you. You guys can come up and play with them at the end once I figure out how to unstick this one. Um, so anyone want to guess what just happened there? Well, one got stuck. It's almost out. I'll get it out later. Anyway, um, so this is steel, and it's not magnetic. So when I drop the magnet through the steel, it comes right out. And if I stop talking for a second, you can hear that it's making noise, right? However, when I drop it through this copper block, which has cuts in it to make a cool elevator effect, it's moving slowly. And it's the same idea, this induction, is that a magnetic field moving in a, a conductor, something that conducts electricity, is creating a magnetic field that is opposing the motion of this magnet. And so it's slowing down. And so this is my all-time favorite demo that I've been like doing for like three years, and I still think it's the coolest thing in the world. And I know exactly how it works, but it doesn't make it any less cool that it's still happening. So um, afterwards, you guys can come up and play with that. Some more. Now I've lost my, here it is. So again, this is the idea of Lenz's law, Faraday's law of induction. The electricity and magnetism are intimately connected to one another. So now is Lorentz force, which I haven't talked about yet. And so this is the concept that um, electrons have forces, feel force, uh, um, feel forces uh, due to electro, uh, electric field and magnetic fields. And so this is what we actually mean when, if you ever heard someone talk about the right hand rule. So in this scenario, your thumb is still your current, your fingers are still your magnetic field, but we're going to just use the pointer field, finger for simplicity. And then your force that your current is going to feel are your fingers. So they're all perpendicular to each other. They're all right angles. And so this will allow us to figure out what the force on an electron is in a, moving mag in a magnetic field. Keep losing things. So I'm going to do another demonstration, which I just got working today. So we have a battery. I have some really, 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 really strong magnets that I probably can't pull apart to show you that they're magnets. These are permanently stuck together right now. So they're very strong. They pick up this whole pile of paper clips, OK? Now they're all stuck together. So needless to say, it's a very strong magnet. Um, that I now have made a gigantic mess about. So I'm going to put them in a configuration like is shown here on the screen, um, where I have the magnet on the bottom and battery on the top. And this is a copper wire. It's kind of stiff, but it's a copper wire. And so it's a conductor. It conducts electricity. So when I place it on top, OK, this worked like five minutes ago, for those of you who saw it. It's been very finicky. If things have feelings, this thing's definitely like having feelings today. Really? <laughs> That's because there's metal under the table. Try again. There we go. Everyone see it? This is also really cool, isn't it? So what's happening is that we have battery. And current has a plus and a minus. Doesn't matter. In this demonstration, the plus is the top, the bottom is the minus. And you have this current carrying wire. And so when 
We're going to use our right hand thumb, our thumb rule. So this current's flowing through these wires. And when it gets to here, the current is in this direction. Whoops. It gets unbalanced. And the magnetic field is going down. So current's this way, field's down, so the force is going out of this board. But on this side, I have to use the right hand. I messed this up last night practicing and couldn't figure out why it didn't work is because I was using my left hand and the rule is the right hand rule. So, so your current is going this way in your wire, but your magnetic field is going down, which is hard to do with my hand um, this way. So now, <laughs> this way. So now the force is going into the board. And so what it means is this wire feels a force into the board, this side of the wire feels a force out of the board, which causes it to spin. So math, which I will now show, this math equation basically is telling you that this is why, what's going on. That there's a torque, there's an there's a angular force going on in this, this current carrying wire, which is really neat. So, so that's some of the demos for now. Um, we'll come back and do some more, and again, at the end, we can, we can play with them, certainly. Um, so I've kind of touched on this a little bit, but the idea of what is a magnet. So most of you, when you think of a magnet, probably think of these things I keep sticking to paper clips. Um, something you put on your refrigerator, a bar magnet, a horseshoe shaped magnet. And that's what I show over here. But um, at the magnet lab where I work, when I think of a magnet, I think of something more on the lines of this. Something that's a coil of wire, um, shown here. Or in Tallahassee, Florida, which I'll talk about in a couple minutes, the magnets are even a little stranger looking. They're made of flat disks of copper that we then stack on top of each other and make long coils out of. So they all kind of, they're all magnets. They all have things stick to them. But the horseshoe magnet and the bar magnet are permanent magnets. They're always magnet. They're always sticking to things. Whereas these are electromagnets where they're only magnetic when we flow uh, current through them. So some different distinction, distinguished differences and um, hopefully that'll help you follow what I'm going to talk about. Um, so to give you an idea of what a magnetic field strength of scale is, so that hopefully you'll be super impressed by the high magnetic field lab that we have in Los Alamos. Um, the Earth's magnetic field is 3 times 10 to the minus 5 Tesla. Tesla is a unit of magnetic field strength, so it's very, very small. It's a lot of zeros. Fridge magnets, which we're all familiar with, are on the order of 5, 0 0.005 Tesla. So Still much bigger than the Earth's magnetic field, but not really that magnetic. For any of you who have had an MRI, I've had a, had a bunch, so they're giant tubes with magnets in them um, to do imaging of your body. Maximally, they're seven Tesla. They're usually on the order of one or three Tesla. So this is an or two orders of magnitude, two, 100 times bigger than a refrigerator magnet. Then, if you're really lucky and you go to a good university that has a lot of money, you have access to a 20 Tesla magnet. And that's about as big as you can commercially get in most universities to do science research with. And these are superconducting magnets, which I'm not going to talk too much about, but they're materials that you need to have kept really cold to be magnets. So there's, there's even different types of magnets in terms of electromagnets. So moving forward, hopefully we can think back to these scales and I'll reference them again. So I couldn't figure out what to put on this slide, um, so it's just the intermission blank slide. Um, I wanted to find really nerdy pictures of myself as a high school student, but uh, we didn't really have digital cameras when I was in high school, so I don't have any digital <laughs> photos of me in high school. Um, and I didn't think about it until it was too late to put them up. Um, but briefly for some of uh, more of the kids here, I just wanted to give you an idea of how I got to be where I am. Um, I grew up in New Jersey. Uh, I was really active in high school in a lot of different things. I played sports, I ran track, I played field hockey, I played the piano, I was a Girl Scout for a really long time. Um, I really liked school. Um, I took a lot of physics classes, chemistry classes, biology classes, but my favorite subjects in school were actually English. I loved English. I still love writing and reading and writing angsty teenage poetry when I was younger. And, um, when it came time to decide where I wanted to go to school, what I wanted to do with my life, I decided I didn't want to go into English because I just really enjoyed it and I wanted it to be more something I could just do for fun. Um, so that left me with science, which I did a lot of science. I didn't like biology, so that wasn't an option for me. And so it became between chemistry and physics. Chemistry scared me, it still kind of scares me. I was always afraid I was gonna poison myself or blow myself up. 
Um, chemistry was not for me. My best friends are chemists, my husband's a chemist, but it was definitely not, not for me. So that basically left me physics. And in full disclosure, physics was probably my worst class. I was not very good at it in terms of what I felt I should be good at it. You know, I had to think about it, I had to think a lot, um, I got frustrated a lot, but I enjoyed it and I thought it was really interesting. And I used to annoy my friends being like, you can explain everything with physics. Like, you hear that fire truck going down the street, here how it's different, it's one end and the other end, that's physics. Everything can be explained by physics, even chemistry and biology and everything else, even if the chemists don't agree with me, so. Um, so I went to college. Um, and I went to a school called Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, it's right outside of Boston. This is my little plug for liberal arts education. Um, I wanted to go to a liberal arts school because again, I wanted to take English classes and art classes and I took art history, I took Shakespeare. Um, I had an English professor ask me why I wasn't an English major my first year of college and that maybe I should rethink my career plans. Um, I think I'm glad I didn't rethink my career plans. But in any case, um, this is where I first learned how to do research and I first was exposed to magnets. I was really lucky in that this university had a 40 Tesla pulse magnet. Um, I'll talk more about pulse magnets in a moment because that's what I'm doing now. But if you'll remember, I showed you that superconducting magnet that was 20 Tesla. And that's a pretty strong magnet to get in a university. We had a 40 Tesla, so twice as strong. But it was a pulse magnet. And so this is an example of the magnet that we used. Um, again, it's like a coil of wire like this. It's got some other stuff on top of it, but this is like the main essence of it. Um, it was run by a giant capacitor bank, which again I'll talk about in a couple slides. Basically stores energy and you dump it all into this magnet so you can get a magnetic field. We had this giant pump, vacuum pump, the size of like a bathroom and it was really noisy and down the hall. So, and some electronics. So this is where I was first exposed to research. And I didn't know it, but as an undergrad, I got to write papers. And so I'm second author, but as like a, I don't know how old I was, like 20 year old, this is super exciting. My name is on a paper that people could read. Um, and that kind of got me more hooked on the idea of doing, doing research. So I went to Florida State University for my graduate school, where I got my doctorate. And the reason I went there is because they had the National High Magnetic Field Lab. The United States has three facilities in the National High Magnetic Field Lab, Tallahassee, Florida, Gainesville, Florida, and Los Alamos, which is where I am now. So the magnets in Tallahassee, there's some superconducting magnets, which I'm not gonna really talk about, which are the lowest field strengths, to so go to about 15. And then they have these DC resistive magnets. Um, oh, I, don't, I didn't bring a plate. But again, they're made out of what we call Francis Bitter plates. Um, they're copper plates various sizes. Um, when you add these all up with all of their reinforcement materials, they're probably like this big or wide. Um, and they have a bunch of holes in them and you stack them on top of each other and make long coils. And the reason there's holes in these is because they get really hot. So they're electromagnets. You put current through them and they produce a magnetic field. But they're copper, so the amount of current you need to get them to 35 Tesla would like melt the copper if you didn't keep them cold. So we flow water through them constantly. I made a cheat sheet, which I've now, of course, lost. Um, but it was like 4,000 4, gallons of water like a minute to keep these cold. It's just constantly flowing cold water through these, these systems. Um, and so again, these magnets are on the scale of like half a car. They're like this big. And then I'm studying something the size of a grain of rice, if I'm lucky. So the scale of things is a little strange and something I always think about. And now they also have the 45 Tesla hybrid, which is the largest DC magnet in the United States. So DC means direct current. It means you put a current, um, not like your wall, which is AC, where you have an oscillating current, but a direct straight line current through a magnet, and it'll just sit at a field. Um, so you can go to 45 Tesla. It's made of a superconducting magnet and a DC magnet, and it is the size of it's probably two or three stories high. Um, it's like, it's a hard scale. I'm not sure how tall that ladder is. I'm guessing it's 15 foot ladder. I don't know. But this is the bottom of the magnet or what's holding all the liquid nitrogen and water for the magnet, which is shown here. Um, this is the top of the magnet, which you can stand on. Um, that hole's like this big. 
Um, my favorite experience from grad school is actually running an experiment in this magnet, which was hard to get time on because everyone in the United States who's doing high magnetic field research wants to use it. You have to apply for it. Um, the magnet lab, both there and in Los Alamos, is run by the National Science Foundation. So if you want to use our magnets, it's free, but you have to write a proposal and ask to use them and get permission to use them. So in any case, um, I used to stand on top of the magnet when it was at 15 Tesla. Its full strength is 45, so just a, like a third of the magnet field, um, which I'm unclear if I was allowed to do or not, but I, I did it anyway. And um, I had a belt buckle that was made of metal, and as I got closer to the center of the magnet, my belt buckle would just like start twisting, and it was a really uncomfortable feeling that my pants were like, being pulled away from me while I was standing on top of this magnet. And that was only 15 Tesla. So I can't imagine what it would feel like to be at full field. My graduate advisor always said that his wish in life was to be put in the center of the magnet and feel like what it would feel like to be in 45 Tesla. Um, but I'm pretty sure they wouldn't have let him do that. So that probably wouldn't have stopped him, but he, he didn't do it. Um, so that was the DC field. And so once I graduated and got my doctorate, I was like, what am I going to do next? I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing because I really enjoy it. So I was lucky enough to get a postdoc at Los Alamos National Lab where I work at the pulse field facility. So now we're going to go back and talk about pulse field magnets. So if you want to go above 45 Tesla, you need to use a pulse field magnet. This is because the, the strength of materials, um, it's more of an engineering problem than anything else. Um, how current works, you need to go to pulse fields. So this is kind of a schematic of how it works. You have a power supply, we have um, like a battery, a giant battery, and it charges up a capacitor bank, so again, battery. And then you, this kind of works, you flip a switch, I essentially like push a button, and all of the power in the capacitor bank, all the current, goes into the magnet, and you get a magnetic field that lasts, that goes to a very high field, so these are 60 or 65 Tesla usually, so now we're talking three times the size of a typical 20 Tesla research magnet, three times the size. But it only lasts a fraction of a second, 10 milliseconds. Right, it goes up in 10 milliseconds, so it's a little bit longer. So you're running a whole experiment to zero to 65 Tesla in like a blink of an eye. It's over before you know it, um, which in and of itself creates challenges, which I'm not going to talk about. But what does that mean? These magnets are, are not physically very large, but the strength is very large, and so you're putting an immense amount of strength on uh, force on materials. Because if we remember the force uh, right hand rule, you're going to get a force on anything that's conducting electricity or can conduct electricity. So these magnets, not only do they fail, they're going to fail. Like it's just life. One actually did today. It was really lame actually. It didn't make a lot of noise, um, which I guess is good for the magnet, um, for us. But so this is a really small example of a magnet. The ones I use are usually like this big, but I thought this was really cute and it looked really interesting. Um, so this was a bunch of wire and it had a, other materials to help it stay together. And this is where you attach it to like the capacitor or battery to put charge in it so it'll be a magnet. And I don't know how it happened, but it clearly failed and its guts fell apart. Um, so that's kind of the example of this. These magnets just have an incredible amount of forces put on them um, and they will blow up. And so, oh, steel. So in our really big magnets, this is really surprisingly heavy, um, <laughs> we actually have to use really strong materials to hold even things together. So this is an example of some of the world's strongest steel that you can see has been blown apart and really beat up because a magnet exploded and did this. So. Afterwards, you can come up and it's not too sharp. We can look at it. So even if you don't know anything about magnets or physics or whatever, it's just amazing to think of how much power these, these uh, magnets have in them. So again, this is kind of, um, this is an old example of a magnet. This is the magnet in there. And then this is the magnet failing. You can see debris. Um, it's like a little explosion. So these magnets use a megajoule of energy, which is equivalent to only a stick of dynamite. I was kind of disappointed it wasn't more dynamite. But another way to think about it is the amount of energy that it, or power it would take to, to run this magnet with light bulbs is a million hundred watt light bulbs. 
to pulse this magnet for 15 milliseconds or whatever. So that's like a, that's a lot of magnet of light bulbs. Um, so again, a lot of power is being put into these magnets that run over a very short period of time. Now, if you want to go above 60, 65 Tesla, which is what uh, most of our scientists use in Los Alamos, you have to go um, to our 100 Tesla magnet, which is unique in the, it's the world's, first of all, the world's largest pulse field magnet. So this is the largest magnetic field that you can get in the world without blowing up your sample. Because um, you can get like 700 Tesla or something really large, but you're going to blow up everything at the same time. This will not destroy whatever you're studying. Um, this is the generator that we run half of the magnet off. So we have some of the magnet runs on a capacitor bank, like our smaller magnets, and the rest of it runs on this giant generator that is bigger than this room. Um, those are people, obviously, but it's for scale. You know, these are huge <laughs> machines, uh, machine generator. And what we do is we, do I have a picture? No, I don't. Um, we can show you kind of here. So essentially, you have a giant flywheel, a, a giant rotating device that you, we just power up with. So like you can see, this handle is spinning. So we basically get something spinning super fast. And then when we've got it up to speed, which I mean, this is really slow. Does this say how fast it is? No, but it goes really fast. And then we decide, OK, I'm ready to pulse the magnet. And then we dump it. Now I don't know where the battery light bulb is. Oh, here it is. We dump it into the magnet, and that powers the magnet with the idea that this thing was spinning, and then it can produce electricity. And so then you dump it into what I'm showing here is a light bulb. So you can come up and play with when we're done. So. This is over 200 megajoules of energy, which, what did I say? One megajoule was 100 watt light bulb, million. So this is 200 million 100 watt light bulbs. <laughs> I can't even comprehend how many light bulbs that could possibly be. So again, lots of energy. Um, so hopefully some of that made sense. Um, if you guys have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. But if not, I will talk about some of the science I do, and then we'll open it up to more questions. Um, so if we go back to the idea, so why do we use these magnets? Why do we have these magnets? Other than the fact that they're incredibly cool, in my opinion. Um, that in itself is not enough justification to have a whole lab just because things are fun to play with, although it would be nice. Um, we use these magnets to study materials, to understand properties of materials, so that we can make, um, with one idea in mind, to make materials do what we want them to do. The reason probably most of us have cell phones in our pockets is because at one point in time, people were studying materials and were like, man, we can make tiny computers out of these materials. Um, so it's fundamental research like that that I do, other scientists do, that really can lead the way to technological advances. So if we go back to the right hand rule, um, electrons in a magnetic field feel a force, and this causes them to move in circles. This is a very oversimplification, but these, these electrons moving in circles have different energies. And these energies form in different levels. So level, level one, level two, level three, level four. They just have different separate energies. When you sum up all of these energies of these electrons moving around in a material, their energy can be thought of as a surface of energy, like a ball of energy. And the shape of this energy defines different properties of a material, how well it conducts electricity, how maybe it doesn't conduct electricity. Um, is it a superconductor? Can it co carry infinite conduction forever and ever and ever? Um, so as a physicist, I want to understand what this energy surface looks like so I can understand more about the material. And so what I'm showing here is some data that we took up to 65, I think, Tesla. Um, resistance measurements, so resistance is a measure of how electricity flows through a material. So if something has a large resistance, it um, is more like a plastic, it won't conduct electricity. If something has a very low resistance, it's like copper, it, electricity will flow through it very well. So when I measure resistance as a function of magnetic field, I see these wiggles. My advisor used to call it wiggle science. Um, you see these oscillations in your, in your 
in your measurements. And these are a bunch of different angles. So I basically move my sample a couple degrees, pulse the magnet, wait an hour, 45 minutes for it to cool down, rotate, pulse the magnet. So this is, I don't know, 15, 20, this is a couple days worth of experiments in the 65 Tesla magnet. I care about these wiggles, so I, oh, okay, real quick. So the reason I was studying this material is because I wanted to know whether or not its energy surface looked like an apple, so whether or not there was kind of dimples in the top or the bottom, or whether it looked more like a donut, whether well, there's a hole in the middle. Um, because these two different shapes of its energy would mean two different things for how it, how it conducts electricity, how it, the electrons interact. So I wanted to look at these oscillations or wiggles, so I fit curves to all these lines and I subtract them so I get straight lines. And now you can see these oscillations or wiggles really nicely. And what they tell me is that at far away from 90 degrees, so minus 11, 140 degrees, the far ends, those oscillations look different than those in the middle, 90 degrees. You can visually see there's something different happening here than on the far ends. And so what this tells me is that the shape of my energy is actually some place between an apple and a donut, <laughs> where it's almost a donut, but the hole doesn't go all the way through. And I, could, I got all that from these wiggles, which I mostly just think are really pretty, but it also tells me really cool science. Um, another thing I can do with this material is measure these wiggles as a function of different temperatures um, to, to learn about how these electrons interact with each other. Um, and this, in this way, um, I measure, sorry, I'm going to walk in front again. I measure this difference in amplitude, how, how large this oscillation is. And so for the lowest temperatures, I have a very large oscillation, whereas the highest temperatures, I have a small oscillation. And what this tells me when I do some math is that my electrons, electrons have a mass. It's called m, let's say. The electrons in this material interact in such a way that their mass is 0.2 times m. So they're, they effectively are lighter than a normal electron. They're interacting with each other makes them lighter than a normal electron. And this is important because materials that have Lighter electrons can um, have current travel faster in them, and that makes them more likely to be used in devices because everyone wants their smartphone or their computer to work quickly. We don't want them to work slow. So we're looking for materials that can carry electricity current faster. So that's what these experiments of a couple weeks of my life told me, which is exciting. Um, so to kind of summarize, uh, electricity and magnetism are intertwined. They are two facets of the same coin, two faces of the same coin. They're electromagnetism. Um, to create large magnetic fields, we need a lot of energy. Um, 100 mil 200 million light bulbs. Um, and then studying these materials can help us as scientists, uh, help develop new materials so that we can advance technology. Um, and that is it. Thank you. I have no idea how long. I'll be happy to take questions or talk more.